This program is brought to you by National Gallery Singapore. Her life was shaped by the twists and turns of fortune. She lost her mother during her childhood, but attained artistic achievements in her youth. An unexpected blissful union with an eminent politician was overshadowed by an impending world war. Cheers. Her dramatic experiences transformed her into a worldly woman. But a long, dark passage awaited her. Georgette Chen's seven blissful years with her husband Eugene were disrupted in 1937, the year the Second Sino-Japanese War began. It soon escalated into the largest Asian war in the 20th century. I thought I got used to it, but... Although Georgette had lived through the First World War during her childhood, turbulence still troubled her. For her, the years leading up to the Second Sino-Japanese War were already unsettling. Her husband was in political exile. The former foreign minister of China was unable to return to the mainland and had to seek refuge in Hong Kong. 那么一九三四年呢Despite the vexing challenges, Georgette continued to paint and exhibit her art. She remained prominent in Paris, a city where she spent her formative years and loved dearly. There, Georgette held a solo exhibition of 42 works at Galerie Barriero in 1936. Her paintings were also accepted by two major exhibitions, the Paris World Fair and Les Femmes Artistes de Duhop at Musée Judy Pum in 1937. Soon, Paris was attacked too. While World War II was raging in Europe, Japan targeted Hong Kong. The fall of Hong Kong after a 17-day siege on 25th December 1941 became known as Black Christmas. Winter was not merely a season, it turned into a bloody occupation. Here is the news. Japan's long threatened aggression in the Far East began tonight with air attacks on United States naval bases in the Pacific. Fresh reports are coming in every minute 
The latest facts of the situation are these. The couple's fugitive days were often spent living out of hotel rooms. A formal declaration of war against both the United States and Britain. But deep down, Eugene knew this little luxury would not last. Open up! Yeah, yeah! Oh, Mr. Eugene Tent! Open up now! What do you want? You and your wife. Come with us. Only if you do not harm my wife. That depends on you, Eugene. Sir. <laughs> <laughs> Eugene and Georgette were arrested and interned in Hong Kong. Little was written about Georgette's life during this period. The Japanese later moved them to the French concession area in Shanghai. They were kept under house arrest between 1941 and 1944. She was in her late 30s and Eugene in his 60s. Despite his frail age, Eugene stood courageously firm, as reflected in Georgette's letter, written in 1961. One of the first things he dared tell his captors at the height of their victories was that they would lose the war. That was his main message to them, and he won their respect rather than their wrath. Georgette's nephew, Chen Ping, is a rare surviving relative. He was in high school when Georgette and Eugene were under house arrest. At 86 now, he still has some memories of his weekly visits. As people would often disappear without reason, Eugene insisted that his wife be with him everywhere he went. It will benefit you and your wife if you collaborate with us, Eugene Song. Deep down, you despise Wang Ching Wei because he was a puppet. If I become a second Wang Ching Wei, you would despise me as well, wouldn't you? Other. Chinese readers have several faces and several tongues. But you, Yujin san, you have one face and one tongue. That is exactly why I must not be made to lose at one and only face and tongue, having no spares. Even as the Japanese officers saw Eugene as a man with only one face, Georgette must have been enamored with that one man. She would obsessively paint this one face over and over again through the turbulent years of war and trauma. Good morning, dear. Good morning. Are you ready? For you? Always. And he was always ready to pose for me. That always helps an artist. He always told me not to sew, because there were many tailors who could do the work. And if I wanted to sew, then it was better to take up my easel and paint instead. Eugene may have been strong in spirit, but his flesh was turning weaker with each passing day. For Georgette, the zeal to immortalize her light motive of love burned even stronger as she struggled against the tide of time.
It's often said that time and place define an artist's motifs. Although Georgette was interned for about three years, she did not stand still as a painter. To Georgette, even something as humble as a basket had its significance and beauty. I discovered that by going round and round in different places, especially marketplaces, you would see practically all the baskets there, which would represent a particular part of the country. For instance, in China, if you painted a basket, you would know from what district that basket came from. That's why people used to call me Basket Chen. And as a matter of fact, I think baskets are very beautiful. In the first half of the 1940s, Georgette painted mainly still life and landscapes of Hong Kong and China. With more than a decade of Parisian art training behind her, she gradually manifested stylistic changes. There are some similarities and differences. At both sets of paintings, uh, she tended to adopt the top-down perspective, so it's as if she's looking down at the composition of objects rather than looking straight on, uh, as with most other still lifes. So this is something that uh, you see carried throughout the uh, Paris period onto the Hong Kong period. The differences would be that in her Hong Kong period still lifes, the colours tend to be a bit more blended. You don't see the very distinct brushwork, that's one. And the other distinguishing feature is that the composition tends to be more complex now using different props, uh, bowls, baskets, chairs, and therefore having creating a, a much more dynamic viewing experience for the viewer. She has come a long way, you know, from uh, painting in a Zizan style of composition. So there's so much of the cultural uh, elements that will go into this. And I'm sure, you know, all this, uh, along with her personal mental state and the kind of uh, emotional intensity all coming together, will make these still lives such uh, intensities of, of culture, of, you know, of historical background. The years of war and unrest brought ceaseless displacement and endless confinement. These could be the reasons why Georgette held on all the more fiercely to the desire for locating the self in history and geography. These landscapes are very different from the earlier uh, European landscapes. But even you know, for the same period, the still lives and landscapes, she appears to be more descriptive in terms of the forms of buildings trying to perhaps, you know, going back to Cezanne again in creating a composition of interest. Many would have found the making of art in the midst of war an outrageous luxury. For the peace-loving Georgette, she was painting not just in spite of the war, but perhaps because of the war. I am a product of four world events, all wars, two Chinese revolutions, the one of Dr. Sun and Mao Zedong, and the first and second world wars, in all of which I've been inexorably involved. The wonder is that my profession should have been one of goodwill and peace. Only God can answer for these paradoxes. In May 1943, Georgette held a solo exhibition at the Metropole Hotel in Shanghai. More than 40 paintings done between 1938 and 1941 were displayed. This period was just after the war broke out and before her internment. She had captured the landscapes and people of the beautiful South a region where her Nanshin roots lay. A year later, 
Georgia experienced the deep winter of her life. In the spring of 1944, her great supporter and leitmotif of love died under house arrest. Eugene Chen did not live to see his prediction come true that Japan would lose the war. It happened just the following year after his death. Eugene was given a revolutionary hero's burial as a mark of respect for his immense contribution to China. But the circumstances of his death are shrouded in controversy. Yatu 要火化,要这个张丽英作为他的夫人要填写一个文件。心脏病,有三个月。After Eugene died, the Japanese soldiers took almost everything away from their house. Eugene's portraits painted by Georgette were left untouched. With her love immortalized in paintings, time stood still for Georgette. For the rest of her life, she would refer to her days with Eugene as deathless. Dear Eugene, what a proud mark he has left in the history of modern China. He loved me the more for sharing his beliefs. With a total of eight portraits, Eugene became the single most painted person in Georgette's life. She paints her husband, uh, Eugene Chen, in a different way from the way she would paint anyone else. If you look at the facial feature of Eugene Chen in the portraits, a lot more colors are being used, and there is a careful interplay of very short brush strokes, almost like uh, here you're capturing something that you feel very strongly for. Quoting Georgette. Georgette was talking about her life subsequently in Singapore and said, as I am engaged precisely in the creation of beauty, I have recaptured the deep joys of my former days with dear Eugene. I think deep joys will be exactly what these portraits were about. This has to be the explanation for doing portraits of Eugene Chen differently from anyone else. Uh, it is, yes, descriptive, but it is descriptive in a way that it is emotive. In Georgette's own words, although life must end, art lives on. Life is not as we plan it. It is a journey with much anguish, tragedy, and blessings intermingled. Joy and sorrow seem to be the mysterious and constant companions, 
and mere man must share and accept them and carry on. Dr. Ho Yong Chi, a legal historian, was Eugene's good friend and aide. Naturally, it would be his duty to stand by his friend's widow, who was in her most vulnerable state. Loneliness can break even the strongest of souls. And vulnerability is, at times, a woman's folly. After World War II ended, the Chinese Civil War once again plunged China into strife and unrest. A series of interim governments were grappling for control. During those transition years, the newly widowed Georgette found solace in her paintbrushes. She traveled all over China to document the homeland she loved and in the way she knew best, on canvas. Georgette, whose ancestors were from the water town of Nanxin, had a deep love of rivers, canals, and the sea. The government lent me a boat so that I could look for the things I wanted to paint. It was very enjoyable. And if I were to be able to go back to China, I would certainly like to live in Suzhou, which I used to call the Venice of China. You see many river themes in Georgette's paintings. This could be a reflection of uh, artists of her era in general in uh, painting outdoors, wanting to capture the fleeting effects of light. The rivers were also specific locations that had connections to different parts of her life, be it in Hong Kong or in France and later in Singapore. You do see her returning to these subjects uh, quite frequently in her work. So perhaps, you know, uh, these locations also helped her to establish a kind of a sense of rootedness or belonging uh, to the place uh, where she lived and practiced. During Georgette's wandering years from 1944 to 1947, her father, Zhang Jingjiang, lived in New York with his second wife and their children. Of Georgette's sisters, Therese and Suzanne remained in China. Yvonne migrated to the United States, while Helen returned from America to China after the war. In 1946, Georgette visited her third sister Suzanne, who had slipped into depression after separating from her unfaithful husband. The meeting in Beijing was to be their last. Suzanne's son, Chen Ping, was given a noteworthy responsibility. My 
Two years after her husband Eugene died, Georgette appeared to regain a sense of optimism. Life begins at forty. We are still young. She painted her most iconic self-portrait at the age of forty. Despite the trauma of loss and grief, she kept her poise and beauty. There are many reasons for why artists paint self-portraits. For Georgette Chen, I would speculate that some of the reasons were that well, she was known to like to look good, I suppose. <laughs> so vanity, I think, perhaps played a role. But more importantly, I think uh, it's an existential act. It's an act of uh, documenting your own existence in this world. So I think, to a certain extent, this related to Georgette's uh, self-portraits as well. So, in a 1934 portrait, this was just after she married the love of her life, uh, Eugene Chen. But at the same time, it was a world that was kind of undergoing a lot of turbulence. So you kind of sense this in the portrait that she made at the time as well. Well, in 1946, um, that was after the war, and more importantly, after the death of her husband. So you can sense this sadness in her portrait, but at the same time, there was also this resilience. You can see in, uh, in that self-portrait that she, had, uh, she was ready to kind of take on the world in spite of all the, the difficulties that she had encountered. Could Georgette's self-portrait be a confession of a desire to move on and begin anew? No one knows for sure. But what was certain is Georgette made two key decisions in 1947, a year after she painted the self-portrait. After her exhibition in Shanghai, she left China on the eve of the communist takeover. Georgette moved to New York and married Dr. Ho Yong Chi at her father's house. A second marriage for both. It was the 7th of December, a winter's day. You know, of course, of my remarriage. It came as a surprise to many of my friends, including myself, I must admit. I have indeed determined that it was impossible for me to remarry after the richness of my life with E and planned to devote the rest of my days to my art, which Yi so loved and encouraged. But I allowed Dr. Ho Yun Chi, whom I had known for 10 years and was a close friend of Yi, as well as his colleague, to convince me at last that it was too lonely to live alone in the sad world. Five years before Eugene died, he recorded this in his diary. Dear Dr. Ho, I think Madame Chen will communicate with you shortly for the portrait. She has designed a special chair on which you are to pose. This could mean Georgette painted Dr. Ho in 1939, the one and only known portrait of him. Not much is written about Dr. Ho. Yet, his presence in Georgette's life was far from small. What do you think of this, Pa? We can add it to the end. I'll get you some more references. Thank you, dear. Dr. Ho and Georgette wanted to publish a book as a tribute to the man they both loved and admired. That was five years after Eugene's death and two years after the couple was married. But what drew them together would eventually drive a wedge between them as well. Yeah, yes, that's the one. Congratulations, Georgia. Well, thanks to you, Paul. Oh, my pleasure. It's an impressive collection. May I show you around? Certainly. <laughs> Two years after Georgette moved to New York, she held an exhibition at the Asia Institute. 
It was a widely acclaimed achievement since she was the first Asian female artist to exhibit there. The largest of eight I've done of him, yes. Eighty-five paintings of her beloved motherland, China, drew much attention. The famous American writer Pearl S. Buck, who partly sponsored the exhibition, regarded Georgette highly with these words. Equally interesting is her technique, which shows influences of Asia and Europe combined. It is perhaps true that more than in any other sphere of art, painting reveals the complementary forces of East and West. Certainly, Georgette Li Ying Chen has united them skillfully and effectively. Despite her success in the West, the yearning for China stirred Georgette to restlessness. After two years in New York, she returned to Paris to wait for an open door back to China. Although her former Paris apartment at Rue Renault had been illegally possessed and looted by war refugees, Georgette remained romantic. She reminisced about the tender days spent with her late husband Eugene to her close friend Song Tingling. The only thing the war didn't take away was the indescribably enchanting view from the spacious terraces overlooking the Seine. What a different woman I am now from the one who served refreshments al fresco on them 11 years ago. At that time, I had only experienced love and joy. At this point, she remained hopeful about her marriage with Dr. Ho. I think we are well meted. He is only two years older than me and full of dynamism and ideas. Unlike my life with Eugene, we sometimes quarrel with each other. But his love for me is not less than Eugene's love for me. But Georgette's heart was not entirely emptied for the new marriage to fill. Eugene, the love of her life, loomed large over her second marriage. May I repeat that I always consider myself still as a member of the <coughs> Chen family. Get you some water. My professional name is still Chen, and everybody in Paris called me Madame Chen. The year she returned to Paris, Georgette once again exhibited at the Salon d'Automne. It was her fifth and last exhibition at the Salon over a span of 19 years. One of her landscape paintings was first selected in 1930 the year she married Eugene in Paris. Fresh from the dollar brutality of materialistic New York, Georgette found the embrace of Paris a welcome respite and a balm to her artistic spirit. Yet, hard on the heels of hope and optimism, came a winter year. News of the deaths of three relatives and a friend in 1950 devastated Georgette. She poured out her emotions to her close friend, Jock Yo Fong. This year has been a very sad one, as we have lost many dear ones. Father too passed away in New York. The news of my eldest sister's death was very painful. Suzanne reports that she died suddenly of a disease which could not be diagnosed by the three doctors who attended her. 
the dark passage seemed endless. In October 1950, Georgette sold her Paris studio. She intended to close the door on Europe and turned resolutely towards the East once more. But she was unsure how she would fit into communist China. Although we were considered very left before liberation, now we might be considered too right. Still, we long for home, though there will be no shelter nor work awaiting us. Everything there will have to be started from scratch in a world quite strange to us. The following year, she urged her two best friends back home to help her decide. Your word will be very decisive. Until it comes, we shall not leave Paris. But no decisive word came. Are you ready, dear? Ready. The Penang offer for us both to teach in a newly founded Chinese middle school became urgent. So in the absence of encouraging news on our part from China, and no answer from you, we after long deliberation decided to steer our boat in any case eastward by accepting the post. Once again, the waters of destiny began to propel Georgette in a life-changing move. When she set foot on Penang, the tropics deeply enchanted her. The waterfront with the rows of Malayan straw huts bathing right in the water, whose color is green and violet, make me shout with excitement each time I pass them by. The great variety of fruits with their strange, new and unexpected forms. They are not only wonderful to look at, but delicious to eat. I have been introduced to the durian fruit and consider that my life has been enriched by it. <laughs> During her two short years in Penang, Georgette taught art at Hang Cheng High School. She was believed to have supported Dr. Ho, who was unable to hold down a job. Not all was well beneath her composed front. At that time, I was still the baby cockroach, who in the absence of information was still prepared to trust my husband and follow him blindly. What started as common marital strife turned the whole household into a civil war zone. The last straw for Georgette came when her husband turned into a thief. The estrangement between the couple deepened. Fine. If you don't want to talk, we'll write. We will write then. I think you should know that I can no more be accused of forgery than you can be accused of espionage when you open my letters and read my diaries without my permission. that opening your letters and reading your diary is espionage and punishable by death, then you are accusing yourself of the same crime since you do espionage the same Espionage is a greater life. crime and punishable in some countries by death. If you as a wife can claim the right to my letters and diaries, 
then I, as a husband, can also claim the right to alter the order of a check. Let alone opening my handbag, removing keys from it, and opening personal trunks without my knowledge and permission. Giving away my drawings to Tom, Dick and Harry without my knowledge. In the midst of her battle on the home fronts, Georgette found a sanctuary in the company of the Chen family. Coincidentally, they shared the same surname as Eugene. The Chen family and several others migrated to Penang from China. They were escaping from communist rule back home. Over time, Georgette became more than a friend. She was one of my favorite aunties uh, because she's always smiling. She's always gracious. I mean, she's, uh, she's one of those ladies uh, which even as a child, I knew that she was very cosmopolitan because we knew that, you know, she, ha she came from China and, and uh, she studied in Paris and she studied in New York. And, and for children, you know, that was ex extremely exotic. And, 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 and she spoke French and she spoke English very well. And she spoke Chinese and she spoke Mandarin. Among the three Chen children, Dorothy was the closest to Georgette. What drew both of them together was art. But what endeared Dorothy to Auntie Georgette even more was her sensitivity. Ever since I was little, she had always said to my parents that she didn't really want to what we call formally teach me because she felt that it's important for me to develop uh, naturally rather than, you know, being uh, structured into uh, some kind of a, a codified process. So I, I, I just did things naturally. My memory of her was more an adult who, who actually she played with us as children, which, you know, in that generation, my parents' generation, it was unusual. Memories of Georgette have been kept alive by the Chens even after they migrated to the United States in the 1980s. Portraits of the two younger Chen children, drawn by Georgette, are still hung in their homes. For Dorothy, her experience as a child sitter was somewhat amusing. Dolly, shall we sing a French song? Au clair de la luna, au clair de la luna, mon ami Piero, mon ami Piero. She fed me endless hard uh, candy, the kind that you suck on. So I believe on my right cheek, if you really look close, it's slightly bigger than the other. That's one. And secondly, um, she was very smart. She didn't have children of her own, but she really knew how to entertain children. Uh, she made me learn French songs. So, uh, and you know how children are very good parrots, so we parroted. That kept me sitting there for hours. Mon ami Pierrot. Besides the portraits, the Chens own another of Georgette's works, which was painted in their house in Kuala Lumpur. It is one of her most iconic visual motifs of the tropics. As kids, we were always hanging around, not for the reason that most people think, because um, on the plates, the rambutan and the magu skin was cut half open, right? Uh, cut into half and opened. And as you know, it oxidizes in the air, so it gets darkened. And the kids, and I remember I, my brother and I will hang around and they said, Hi, because when it gets oxidized, she needs to cut open another one. So all the rambutans and mangosteens you see in the painting were eaten by me and my brother. 
So close was Georgette to the Chen family that she confided in them through letters written during the dark days leading up to her divorce. Everywhere, helping hands, which I trace to you. She continued to keep in touch with Dorothy right into the 1990s after moving to Singapore. It was in Singapore that Georgette made a clean break from what she called six years of unbelievable cruelty. Before she filed for divorce, she expressed her anguish to Dr. Ho in a letter. Our relations are indeed daily becoming more difficult, and perhaps a time is approaching when it will be best for both of us to regain our freedom. I am beginning to sympathize with Pauline, your first wife, for running away from you. After a torturous wrangle with Dr. Ho, and under the expert mediation of her former teacher, Mrs. Shaw, Georgette's divorce was finally inked. But not without a spat. Look, I don't care what name you choose to use in the future, but I don't want the name Chen to appear on this document. No, no, easy. The whole trouble was, this woman continued to use the name Chen, although she is Mrs. Ho. In this final confrontation, Georgette decided to lose the battle in order to win the war. Correction was Mrs. Ho. She agreed to the crossing out of Chen on a divorce paper. But she would forever carry the name Chen on canvas. What her broken marriage did not destroy was her love for painting. A love that found fullest expression in her final destination, Singapore.